better than a hallelujah sometimes. God loves the drunkard's cry and the soldier's plea not to let him die. Better than a hallelujah sometimes. We pour out our miseries and God just hears a melody. How beautiful the mess we are. Our loose cries are breaking hearts. Better than a hallelujah. Better than a hallelujah sometimes Tears of shame for what's been done And silence where the words won't come It's better than a hallelujah sometimes Church bell ringing And better than a choir Singing out Singing out We pour out our miseries And God just hears a melody How beautiful the mess we are Honest cries and breaking hearts And better than a Miss Pam and today's children's sermon is about carrying loads of burdens in your life. So to start off, I have four different items. You're not seeing them yet, but they're right here in front of me. Four different items that I'm going to lift up and put on these tables behind me. As I'm lifting up these items, I want you to pay close attention to what these items have in common, meaning what's the same about all of them. So let me start with the first item. So the first item I have here is a 10 pound kettlebell. I like to use this to exercise to make me really strong. So that's why I use a kettlebell. Okay, the next item that I have, the next item that I have here is an alumni directory book. Okay, this is actually my dad's book. So what this book actually is, it's a list of all the names of people, including my dad, who went to Howard University um, and graduated from that school. So that is what this book is, Alumni Directory. Okay, I'm sure a lot of you know what this item is that I'm about to lift up. Oh, so this item here is an air fryer, okay? How many of you have this in your kitchen? So this has changed the cooking game for me and my family. I love using this to cook. Last but not least, I have this item. So this item right here is a pot. It's empty, nothing inside of it. But of course you put plants in it, flowers, whatever you like to put in here. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you, 
what is in common with all four of these items that I lifted up and put on this table? Can you think of what's the same? Notice my facial expressions when I was lifting up these items. So if you guess that these items are heavy, you are exactly correct, okay? So I want you to take this example that I just did and I want you to think about your life. In your life, we have what's called burdens. Can you say that word with me? Burdens. So a burden is something that's very, very challenging, okay? Just like how challenging it was for me to lift up all of these items and put on this table. It's hard. It can be stressful too. So in your life, you have many things that are challenging, that are burdens, and some examples of those are maybe you have a disability that keeps you from doing day-to-day -day activities like reading, riding, jumping, running, okay? Another burden that you might have in your life is um, maybe a struggle that you might have, okay? You might struggle to make good grades in school, or you might struggle to make friends, or you might struggle with an activity like sports, uh, baseball, softball, or painting, anything like that, okay? Another burden in your life that you may have is a serious illness. You are a family member that keeps um, them from doing what they enjoy doing in their lives, okay? So with all of these burdens that I gave examples of, how does that make someone feel? If you struggle with something in your life, if you have a disability, if you're seriously ill, how does that make you feel? Right, it might make you feel sad for one, might make you feel worried, might make you feel pretty angry, right? And it's also very frustrating. So burdens may make you feel sad, angry, worried, or stressed, okay, frustrated. So the thing is that in our life, we have people, we have things that help us to carry these loads of burdens. Remember, burden means something that's challenging, right? So can you think of people or things that help you to carry these loads of burdens in your life? Because I know you don't carry them alone, right? So let's think, maybe you have your family, mom, dad, brother, sister, uncle, to help you carry these burdens by talking to them. Okay, you might have your friends or your best friend to talk to. You might even have your pet that you talk to, okay? Even though your pet can't talk to you back, unless you have a parrot. But for the most part, they're great listeners, right? So all of these people and things help you to carry these burdens or challenges in your life. But I left someone else out. I left a very important person out. Who did I leave out? That's right, I left out Jesus. So Jesus, of course, is a very important person to lean on when you have burdens in your life, okay? He's always going to be there for you. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What does that mean? I'm going to read that verse again. Chapter 11, verse 28 in Matthew says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So to me, that means that Jesus is saying, if you have challenges in your life, something in your life that's weighing you down, that's really heavy, like when I lifted up these items behind me, really heavy and it makes you feel sad, angry, worried, or frustrated, you should lean on him and he will help you. He might not physically take that burden off of you, okay? He might not take it out of your life, but he's always going to be there for you. When you pray, you want to ask God to help you with these burdens that you have in your life, something that's really giving you a hard time, right? So I would like to go ahead and close this sermon in prayer. Please pray with me. Dear God, I know that in my life I will have many burdens that make, make me feel sad, worried, angry, or frustrated. I'm thankful to know that Jesus is always going to be there for me to help me with these burdens. Help me to continue to lean on you through prayer, and by reading words of encouragement in the Bible. All of this I ask in your name I pray. Amen.
Good morning. 44 years ago, I was a forester. It's important to the work of a forester in the field that you be able to tell where due north is and make sure your directions are right. If you're running a line through the woods and following that line for five miles, it's really important to be exactly on that direction. If you're off a few degrees at the start, you're going to be way, way off at the finish. So how did we do that? We used a device called a compass. We didn't have GPS then. The compass kept us straight and allowed us to find true north. Let's take a closer look at just what a compass is. This is our compass. And it's a 44-year-old compass, so it's developed an air bubble in it that shouldn't be there. But in the bezel right here, you can see all of the degrees are marked. And this particular one is a quadrant bearing compass. And here's north, here's east, here's south, and here's west. And when we want to line up, and the magnet is showing it points right there, then we take it and we put it to zero with this little red mark. And guess what? We're lined up. And that, when we aim it across the top at the site, we'll find true north. In order to do that, we had to use this key in this screw to set the declination because the magnetic field, the ambient magnetic field around you at all times is in a constant state of flux and doesn't really reflect what true north is. Why did we have to use that key and set it in the screw to change the offset called declination. Well, the fact is that magnetic north, where the needle points, is not true north. And in order to find true north, we have to make an offset such that we keep on our line and keep straight. The difference between true north and magnetic north is really important. Good morning, Tennyson friends. Today's scripture is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 44 through 58. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure, buried in a field, that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea. It collected everything of fish, and when it was full, they dragged it ashore, sat down, and gathered the good fish into containers, but threw out the worthless ones. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will go out, separate the evil people from the righteous, and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understand all these things so far? They answered him, yes. Therefore, he said to them, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom treasures new and old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left there. He went to his hometown and began to teach them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers isn't this the carpenter's son isn't his mother mary and his brothers james joseph simon and judas and his sisters aren't they all with us so where does he get all these things and they were offended by him jesus said to them a prophet is not without honor 
except in his hometown and in his household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their disbelief. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. I don't know if you know this, but it's happened again. This time, a Michigan jeweler. He's calling it quits after 23 years. He had a great business. He made a lot of money. But Johnny Perry, who owns J&M Jewelers, decided after the pandemic hit, he had to shut down his business. And he, and he started to process and think. And he realized that he had had a great business, made a lot of money, enjoyed himself, but that he hadn't been as happy as he would like and he wanted some adventure. So he decided to set up a treasure quest. He read the news one morning about a man named Forrest Finn. I've talked about him before. Forrest Finn buried $1 million in Colorado that I think was just found this year. So this jeweler went off all over Michigan and buried the contents of his entire store thousands and thousands of pieces, precious metal, jewels, antiques, all over Michigan. In total, he says he buried $1 million worth of treasure. He went through streams, waterfalls, kayaked all over the place, and every single piece is marked with an X and GPS, so he'll know if it's been found. Now, if you wanna get in on this, you're not too late, because the very first hunt starts August 1st with two 100 ounce silver bars worth about $4,000. Finding treasure is fun, or at least it is to me, it's exciting. I think of all the modern examples, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Romancing the Stone, Goonies, National Treasure, there's a ton of those things. But there's a huge celebration when a treasure is found. So all those people hunting for, for treasure in Michigan, I think they're gonna have a great time especially the ones that find some cool treasure. But suppose someone looks for the treasure with high expectations only to be disappointed in what they find. Remember the scene in A Christmas Story when Ralphie decodes the Little Orphan Annie message? If you've seen this movie, you know what I'm talking about. Ralphie feverishly puts down letter after letter, so excited to see what this important message is gonna be and high with anticipation, all the letters finally on the page, and Ralphie looks down and sees, be sure to drink your Ovaltine. All that anticipation. And as he says, all he gets is a crummy commercial. I sometimes wonder if people are less likely to go to church these days because they can tell we don't feel like we have a treasure worth having. What do you think? Do you see church people who have discovered an amazing treasure? Or do you see people who seem to have a ho-hum response to a life with God? There are a lot of questions we could ask out of this pas passage from Matthew, but the ones that scream, that just ache to be asked, are how do we get direction in life and what compass do we use to find that direction? What are the factors that move us towards our goal and is the kingdom of heaven the treasure the church really wants? The Greek word for treasure is where we get our word thesaurus. It's a treasure or a storehouse of precious treasures. Which statement do you think is truer? Churchgoers are being guided by their pursuit of God's greatest treasure or people stopped looking for the kingdom of heaven and their direction is decided entirely on their own. Matthew helps us a little with these questions. In the parable of the pearl, the one seeking is a person on a journey. He or she is looking for fine pearls. The Greek word, by the way, for pearl is margaritas. You need to know that. This is a person who has enthusiasm for the search. There is joy, commitment, and that when the treasure is found, this person sells everything literally so that he can have that treasure. 
taking hold of that treasure God wants us to have involves the whole person. We can't just have a little bit of us involved. It's all involved. It's the experience in searching for and dealing in pearls that led this merchant to recognize the one that is so precious. Um, mostly we prepare for big decisions of life. I think by small steps of trust we take in our daily life. The pearls that the merchant has collected um, also created difficulty for the merchant. All of those things that have been collected before have to be let go in order to have the one. And that's hard. So I want to tell you a story about an 87, 87 year old college student who has some advice for us on this point. On her first day of class, the professor sends the students out to find someone they don't know. And she walks up to a young guy and says, hi, handsome. My name is Rose. I'm 87 years old. Can I give you a hug? And the guy laughed and said, of course you can. She gave him a big old squeeze. And he says, why are you in college at such a young, innocent age? And they laughed again. She said, I'm here to meet a rich husband, get married and have a couple of kids. <laughs> well, the guy said, no, really, why are you here? And she said, I've always dreamed of having a college education and now I'm getting one. So after class, they went and had a chocolate milkshake together and they became really good friends. And over the next three months, she would talk with him every day and she became more and more popular in the school. Well, she shared wisdom with a lot of people and over the course of the year, she kind of really became an icon and she was invited to speak at the football banquet to the entire class. And this young guy said he never forgot what she taught the class. As she began to deliver her speech, she dropped her three by five cards on the floor and she was frustrated and a little embarrassed she leaned in on the microphone and said, I'm sorry, I'm so jittery. I gave up beer for Lent and this whiskey is killing me. I'll never get my speech back in order, so let me just tell you what I know. Well, the crowd of kids laughed and she started. We did not stop playing because we are old. We grow old because we stop playing. There are only four secrets to staying young, being happy and achieving success. You have to laugh and find humor every day. You've got to find a dream when you lose your dreams, you die. And we have people walking around who are dead now and don't even know it. There's a huge difference between growing old and growing up. Anybody can grow old, that doesn't take talent. The idea is to grow up by finding opportunity and change and have no regrets. The elderly usually don't have regrets for what we did, but rather for things we did not do. She ended her speech by singing a song by Bette Midler called The Rose. Have you read the lyrics of that song? It starts off like this. Some say love is a river that drowns a tender seed. Some say love is a razor that leaves your soul to bleed. Some say love is a hunger, an endless aching need. I say love it is a flower, in you it's only seed. It's the heart afraid of breaking that never learns to dance. It's the dream afraid of waking that never takes a chance. It's the one who won't be taken, who cannot seem to give and the soul afraid of dying that never learns to live. Well, Rose finished her college degree that she had started many years ago. And one week after graduation, she died peacefully in her sleep. 2000 college students attended her funeral as a tribute to who she was. My opinion is that Rose knew how to search for treasure. Listen, this treasure of heaven is worth having more than any other treasure. Does it guide your life? The treasure of heaven requires risk and sacrifice. To participate and be possessed by this empire of heaven takes everything. Is it worth everything to you? Have you started your search for it? It's here and now, old as the universe, more precious than anything else. Does it guide you entirely without reservation? Imagine if the church lived like this. And imagine if people saw the church live like this. I think they would say, man, I want to live like that. I want to have what they have. Or on the other hand, if they look at us, will they end up shaking their head and say, 
I don't even like Ovaltine. Which church are we going to be? Which compass is going to guide us? I think, of course, that it needs to be the treasure of the kingdom of heaven. Peace. Amen. Thank you.